Heather Hopper's Hollywood. Miss Hopper is just going on the air. Will you listen, please? Heather Hopper's Hollywood. Miss Hopper is just going on the air. Please listen. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? The Adventures of the Saints, starring Vincent Price. Good evening, darling. The play we're performing for you this evening on Theatre Guild on the Air is called, and I never could understand why. Oh, 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 there's nothing like radio for having a wonderful time. Who cares about watching a girl do the hula? I get a bigger thrill from the voice of the hula. Oh, 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 I love the radio, although television is mine. Oh, why should she scoot Ever since I got my first radio as a child, I have been in search of sounds. Comforting, mysterious, terrifying, enticing. Tuning in I was eavesdropping on a hidden realm, the passage to which was the canal of an eager ear pressed close against the speaker. It was my keyhole to the world about which I knew yet little, a world to which I did not yet belong. Hello, my name is Harry Heuser, and I am inviting you to listen in with me as I revel in sound, as I recall and call forth the voices from the past. I talk back at and engage with them. I can't say um, hell on the radio, can I? No. Well, excuse me. Shut up. Can't you see I've got a running stop you? The wrong, the wrong, the wrong, the wrong, the wrong. In this, my inaugural podcast, I'm going to feature the voice of Ms. Tallulah Bankhead. What are we waiting for, Tom? One of the most recognizable voices in Hollywood, the real Hollywood, I mean, of the studio era. It was a voice often heard on radio, where in the early 1950s, Miss Bank had starred in her own 90 minute variety program titled The Big Show. Radio is good enough for me. You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as Fred Allen, Mindy Carson, Joan Davis. Douglas Fairbanks. Phil Silvers. The Sons of the Pioneers. Margaret Truman. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> the National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at the same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable, Tallulah Bankhead. We've been doing the big show now for a month of Sundays. But today, with Miss Margaret Truman on the program, there's a special feeling of excitement backstage. And I suppose you all are wondering how we were able to get such a prominent personage as Miss Truman to be guest on our program. Well, really, all it took was a telephone call. I called a certain party, and that party called another party, who in turn called another party, uh, naturally, these were all Democratic parties. <laughs> of course, some of the other performers who have never met Miss Truman are a little nervous about it. Well, not me. I I'm not nervous. Joan Davis. <laughs> 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 
You say you're not nervous, Joan, about meeting Margaret Truman? Well, why be? I should. <laughs> What's there to be nervous? About? <laughs> In fact, I'm meeting forward to looking her. <laughs> Oh, you're in great shape, darling. In fact, you're fabulous. <laughs> fabulous? Well, you're not built so hot yourself. <laughs> uh, 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 look, Miss Bankhead, if you're really nervous about meeting Miss Truman, you can just stick close to me. I I'll cover up any mistakes that you might make. You'll cover up any mistakes I make? Oh, sure, I'd just be glad to. I know how it is when you're not a celebrity and, and you meet a celebrity like Miss Truman. Why, well, sure, you're bound to get nervous. But, but out in Hollywood, I see celebrities all the time. Mm. Yeah, why, I live right across the street from where Guy Kibbe used to live. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> One of us ought to stop gargling the drain <laughs> celebrities, big names like that all around me. Darling, you know the name I have made in the theater. Yeah, and they better not let me hear them saying it. <laughs> my dear Joan. Oh, you don't have to thank me. I don't know why I beat my head against the wall talking to you. Well, maybe you're trying to get a shape you like. <laughs> Look, Joan. <laughs> We happen to have Margaret Truman on our show tonight, and I'd hope to start the show off on a high plane. Now, darling, please, would you say as little as possible to Miss Truman? Because, frankly, I look upon your stupidity with the utmost disapproval. Well, I look upon your disapproval with the utmost of stupidity. How else, darling? Joan, we should all try to act our best and look our best today. Well, I look my best. Don't you like my gown? Oh, yes, dear. I always have. <laughs> well, I like the gown you're wearing, Salula. Thank you, Joe. You're pretty dressed up for a radio announcer. <laughs> now, look here, you... Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> you're my guest. You're sorry I'm your guest? Yes. Oh, no, I mean... Uh... <laughs> I'm just sorry I lost my temper. I'm glad you like my gown, Joan, but uh, really, it's nothing. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, if it was any lower on top and any higher on the bottom, it'd be a belt. <laughs> and I specifically asked them to send me Joan Davis, not Betty. <laughs> well, with that dress you're wearing, we practically got all about Eve. <laughs> It is the voice of the mature Tallulah that we hear on those recordings and that we associate with her image. A timbre that was probably the result of her indulging in Craven A's, an English cigarette she was in the habit of smoking. Four packs a day if George Back's novel, The Tallulah Bankhead Murder Case, may be taken as fact. When I tell people I have laryngitis, I get no sympathy at all. Well, I'm not concerned with facts here but with the mystique and the magic of sound. Just listen to this. <laughs> Bravo! That was beautiful, Tallulah. Simply beautiful. Oh, thank you, my dear. And now for an encore. This is how Tallulah explains that magic, the origins of that celebrated voice. Explains it while being voiced by Tova Felshu, the New York stage actress who, a few years ago, played the Hollywood icon in the off-Broadway production of Tallulah Hallelujah. Oh, darling, I didn't always sound like this. Oh, no. I croaked my way through adolescence because they nicked me. They nicked my vocal cords in a tonsillectomy. At least I think it was a tonsillectomy. I do know it involved a doctor. Anyway, I found a way to transform those ill-throated utterances into the voluptuous timbre you hear tonight, and I hope you will never forget. You know, frankly, I do think it was my voice that made me a star. I think without this voice, I would have been just another pretty face. Now, Miss Bankhead was rather a parody of her former self during those radio days. There you go again. She gleefully exploited the image of an idiosyncratic, irascible, and tarnished star with great success. But radio also gave Tallulah the opportunity to snatch the role of Margot Channing in All About Eve from rival Betty Davis. All About Eve. 
Uh, true, there is an Eve in it, and what a part that is. But there's also a glamorous and brilliant leading lady of the theater whose true identity has been kept a secret too long. Uh, tonight, darling, uh, tonight, baby, intends to do something about that. And it allowed her to recreate the role of Connie Porter in Alfred Hitchcock's Lifeboat. I've only done one great film in my entire career, and that was Lifeboat for my lifesaver, Alfred Hitchcock. I don't know, did, did any of you see that film? <laughs> yes, darling, yes. Well, you may have noticed that I was only shot from up above or straight on, never ever from underneath. That's because I didn't wear underwear. It was too constricting. You too, would fall. Lifeboat was adapted for the Screen Directors Playhouse and was broadcast on November 16, in 1950. It was transformed into the story of Connie Porter, from whose perspective the events on the titular vessel were recounted. This is our second day scene. This morning we awakened and we discovered that Mrs. Higgins was no longer a member of our party. During the night she slipped overboard and joined her child. Let's take it easy. I, I'm not feeling my best yet. My, my throat's still somewhat hoarse. Kalula got to be glamorous and tough, cynical and sensitive, heroic and deeply flawed. She gave the performance her all, something that proved quite difficult during the filming of Lifeboat when she was revealing rather too much. There I am swimming in the lifeboat water tank when all of a sudden the cameraman comes right up to my part of the tank. And I figure he's going to take a close-up. Instead he says, Miss Bankin, why in the hell won't you wear underwear? I said, darling, does a woman who wants to be kissed wear a veil? <laughs> You're slow, but you're not dead. <laughs> so then he went strutting over to Alfred Hitchcock and he said, Mr. Hitchcock, I cannot get one shot of Miss Bankett that will pass the Hayes Morality Code. And do you know what my divine Hitch replied? Well, dear boy, what department should we get to remedy this problem? Wardrobe, makeup, or hair? <laughs> This was in 1943. They were already shooting Shirley Temple through gauze to make her look young. I suppose if I made a picture today, they'd have to shoot me through linoleum. <laughs> I'm practically immortal, darling. I've got nine lives and I've only used up three or four. On radio, at least, an actress nearing 50 did not have to worry about camera angles. She could be an entirely convincing romantic lead, alluring even to those too narrow-minded to find beauty in age, or accept that sexuality is not the province of youth alone. You may call me Connie. You did what during the storm, remember? You said, all right, Connie, we might as well go down together. I liked the way you said Connie. It was like a punch in the jaw. Tell me about the bracelet. That's a dead giveaway. You're wanting us to die together like that. Dying together is even more personal than living together. Miss Porter, I've read a lot of your stuff. No, not utterly charming. You want to know what's the matter with it? No, do tell me. You've been all over the world. You've met all kinds of people, but you never write about them. You only write about yourself. You think the whole war's a show put on for you to cover as a correspondent, like a Broadway play. If enough people die before the last act, maybe you might give it four stars. All right, Tavares. Now you listen to me. There was one radio dramatic challenge, however, that Miss Bankhead could not quite meet. Some of my friends in the theater who came to visit me applauded spontaneously when I had a coffee in the Leaving actors nothing but their vocal cords to create a character, radio also exposed the shortcomings of a speaker. And Tallulah is least believable as Connie when she is called upon to deliver a few lines in German, a language with which she was supposed to be familiar. Hold on. To a German like myself, the result is next to unintelligible. We gained another passenger shortly thereafter. Ironically, a Nazi scene from the U-boat which sank our freighter. From the moment of his arrival, it has become my privilege, <laughs> did I say privilege, to serve as his interpreter. Madam, she's in the of, uh, of Rettensvoto. The failed discovered Danes. 
Those are his captain's orders. Ask him if he's a captain. Zinzi, the captain, is you both? Nein, ich bin nur ein Mann, der Besetzung. Kein Offizier. He denies he's a captain or officer, just a crew member. A crew member, a skipper, he's German. That's what I can't stop. Sie haben mein Leben gerettet. Es tut mir leid, dass wir Ihr Schiff versenken müssen. Ja, what's he whining about? He merely is saying that he's very grateful to us for saving his life and regrets very much the U-boat was compelled to sink our ship. Sie sprechen sehr gut Deutsch. Uh, haben Sie Beziehung in Deutschland? Nicht darf ich weiß. What did he say? He says I speak his language well. <laughs> he asked whether I had any German connections. Have you? Certainly not. And how come you know the lingo so well? And how come when I climbed into this lifeboat that you were the only one in it? All dressed up like, like you knew you were going someplace. Because I was going someplace. I was going into a lifeboat. And you certainly didn't forget to bring plenty of luggage along. Luggage? <laughs> you silly, ridiculous act. Another day has passed. I don't like keeping the log in long hand. It's difficult enough to transcribe my typing, but my handwriting reads like some sort of bangy mumbo jumbo. Oh, well, I can always hire code expert to decipher it for me. Here goes. An amazing transformation came over the German from the moment Kovac's knife served as a scaffold. It was the face of a surgeon, of a man who'd forgotten his Nazi oath to Hitler and remembered another unspoken oath to Hippocrates. The thing that got me was his coolness. Spiked the rotten boat and the wave that tauntingly and challengingly pounded our sides. You'd have thought he was operating in a hospital with all the necessary tools and equipment. Gus has not come to. In his stupor, he is struggling violently. There's a bitter touch of irony before my eyes. At Gus's side are two shoes. The tension aboard has not lessened. Still think we're on the right course? Let's play poker, huh? But that's important, man. Uh, uh, Connie. Yes, yeah, Red? Ask our German friend if he still thinks we're not on the right course. Herr Kapitän. Yeah. Glauben Sie immer noch, dass wir nicht an Rüsseltagen Kuss auf Bermuda? What was that again, Tallulah? Glauben Sie immer noch, dass wir nicht an Rüsseltagen Kuss auf Bermuda? Rostonen? Ohne Kompass ist das wirklich schwer zu sagen. He says he can't be sure without a compass. Pretty certain a few hours ago. Well, we probably drifted somewhere on account of the current. Oh, we've been all through that. What's the German doing in this part of the boat anyway? Why? Is he in quarantine? Tell him to get back to the bow where he belongs. I'll do nothing of the sort. There's no need for you to treat the man like a leper. He did save Gus's life, you know. As for our being on the proper course, it's imperative that we get Gus to a hospital as soon as possible. You're aware of that? I am. Then why not listen to somebody who knows? Herr Kapitän, order have and Vienich kuss off the Bermuda. Bitte, gnädige Frau... Uh... Well, we can't fool all of the people all of the time. And Tallulah's was not a Teutonic tongue. Having struggled with similar difficulties for most of my life, I, for one, can identify with her troubles. I wish, however, linguistic challenges weren't the only thing I had in common with the fabulous Mr. Lula Banker. I hope you enjoyed listening along with me during this experiment in podcasting. Tune in again, won't you? In the meantime, if you would like to get in touch or suggest a topic for a future podcast, visit my blog or website by following the link above. Hear you around. Oh, 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 there's nothing like radio for having a wonderful time. Who cares about watching a girl do the hula? I get a bigger thrill from the voice of Tallulah. Oh, 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 I still love the radio, although television is fine. A wife, if she's truthful, will make this admission against her country. Oh, 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 there's nothing like radio for having a one.